because that wonderful viewer sent me all these different sanding possibilities, I've been doing some experimenting and really finding some wonderful things. I've been using the half inch and three quarter to do most of the sanding and on the back of this and it's really working great. I really do like these. These are one of my favorite things that's come about in sanding, I can tell you. So I got to thinking, you know, I'm not using this little one. It could be really good for detail. I found even on these big ones, I'm only using the last little bit of it because I'm, I'm kind of holding it up and using it like like a file almost, you know, and it's it works great that way. So I thought I'll take the 3 8 one, cut it in half. On the one end, I'll put a bull nose, kind of a rounded over nose. The other end, I'll put a flat nose. The other two, I'll just leave like they were. And that's still plenty big and, you know, it gets me in uh, to these tight areas really, really well. Uh, just can't even tell you how much nicer that is than what I've been doing. And like I can get right up here against my f the carving and sand right up into the edges really good. I mean, I had other ways to do this, don't get me wrong, but these things are just nice. The design of them is awesome because it lets you hold the sandpaper around it and you can hold onto the sandpaper really good. So the design of this is what's really nice. Anyway, it just works great. So like I've got this little flattened off spot going right up against the stem and these leaves and I can get right in there and, and do a really nice job. I tell you, with my arthritis now, these are very, very helpful. My hands are really getting bad, guys. I, you know, I honestly, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I don't know how many more years I can do this kind of thing. Um, my left hand is almost useless. <laughs> I can barely use my left thumb and hand now. It's starting to affect my playing. I, I can barely... Uh, you know, play very long because it starts to hurt so bad I'm going to have to, I have to quit playing now. Well, I changed my whole life, no more corporate strife, put your alarm clock away in the drawer. No more conference calls and no meetings in the halls and no business to conduct in a ball. And no self-serving boss, nor the threat of the loss of the paycheck that I've earned it to find. Cause I'll be out on that ranch where I can reach the first branch of that corporate tree grown from on high. I don't own it, I just manage its worth. It's a small slice of heaven placed down here on earth. Care for its trees of water. It's that time where we have to move on to something else in the build, and that would be the fretboards in this case. And I have one of the blanks here. You might recall in the last mandolin that I built, the Almost Heaven West Virginia mandolin, I had forgotten that he wanted a vine in his, and I went ahead and made this fretboard. I couldn't use it on that mandolin, so it's been laying here. It's perfectly good fretboard, nothing wrong with it whatsoever, so at least I'm a leg up here. I've got the first one done. I'm going to put this one on the Florida mandolin, and the reason being because I can't use this abalone shell inlay on the UK mandolin. So that leaves me with what will I put into the UK mandolin, and I'm experimenting. Don't know for sure yet. Worst case is I'll put maybe maple dots or something in there. But right now, here's what I'm trying. I have this binding, which is a perloid type binding. The stuff that I refer to as mother of toilet seat, <laughs> which, you know, it's, I shouldn't say that because that sounds terrible, but it's, it's a plastic that's got this pearl look to it. And anyway, I'm using a leather punch here with the largest hole punch that I have. And it's punching them up in there, which they're staying at the moment. So I have to make quite a few of these before I know if these dots are turning out. I've tried other punches. I've got two other type punches. And I also have a hole cutter for my bandsaw, but 
I don't think any of that's going to work, not the right size or some other problem. So these are going up in there pretty good. Uh-oh, looks like I just split my punch out. That's what happened with my other punch. I guess this stuff is too hard and just splits out my punch. Doggone it, I've just ruined another one. It's never easy being me. As you can see, perhaps I split the side of the punch out there, right there. So I've got several in there, but they aren't coming out. I did make several already. I'm just not completely happy with them. This old school punch here, this very old school punch, you twist it down and it punches. But the problem with it is, this stuff is so narrow that it's pushing it down in this hole. If I had a, a brass plate or something to push against, and I may just go find me something, maybe it would cut them off clean, or a piece of aluminum, maybe that would work. I'll try aluminum first. I've got this in there. I don't think you're going to be able to see too well. I don't think the light is working very well for this. But anyway, I have a piece of that binding in there. I've got it lined up with this hole punch. The problem with this hole punch is that it spins and the binding wants to spin and move. At least these pop out, or at least they have been popping out. And now I say that and now they don't. With a little trimming, that may actually work, so we'll see. I'll make up a bunch of these and see what happens. Hope that shows up okay, but I think you can see I inlaid the dot right there, and uh, it does look like mother of pearl, so I'm not totally displeased with that. Of course, I prefer the real pearl, but that looks pretty darn good. So I think that's what I'm going to go with. Drilled the holes for that. It wasn't too terribly exciting. Just marked them all off nice and even. Got them all ready to go. And now we're going to put the dots in. Been pretty impressed with this canopy glue so far, so I'm just gonna use that to put the dots in with. Down here on earth, care for his trees. I water his son and don't own it, and just rent it from God. <clears throat> this ought to pass through customs without any trouble. Got some fret wire here for the mandolin, and you can see this one's already got a radius to it. Now, this is a flat fretboard, but it's I find it much easier and better to put a little radius on the frets first. That way it keeps the ends of the frets down when you're putting them in there. So my little deal that I made here, I made this in my machine shop. There you go, I think that'll do it.
this way I can't be your fool anymore, darling A fool is what I'll be if I stay Trying out this jig that I made for a guitar fretboard. Um, I'm using it for the mandolin here. Uh, it's a type of plastic that glue doesn't stick to very well, so I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'm going to give it a shot and start by applying my glue to the fretboard itself. I can't cry for you. Just not right to treat my eyes this way I can't cry for you anymore, darling You never made a difference anyway These fretboards like to arch up because when you put your frets in them it expands the top of the fretboard and it, they arch so they're not perfectly flat anymore so it's a little that makes it also a little more complicated i'll give that a couple hours to sit there and we'll see how it turned out i am just way behind on everything so while that fretboard binding is drying i will uh, uh start cutting out the uh slots for the binding on this peg head and this one is the florida mandolin i can't be your fool Just not right to treat my heart this way I can't be your fool anymore, darling A fool is what I'll be if I stay homemade vice clamp that I made you know it's got leather in here and it fits the shape of the neck in this and then it's just a C clamp welded to a bar piece of bar stock that's just down in the vice and that just really works good if the only thing that I would do differently is I probably should have made this a T here and I may do that anyway I may add a weld of support here so that this doesn't flex that would be a lot sturdier but other than that it's really just about perfect I pause the video here again to thank Mr. Nick Bruski from up in Appleton, Wisconsin for sending me a whole bunch of deer antler. That's kind of a unique one there, a real pomaded uh, small antler, but perfect for making deer antler saddles. And then he sent a whole bunch more. Here's one that uh, is split down the middle there, which is fine. In fact, that's just as good as it gets right there. Nice, nice one there. He sent me this great big one here too. Thank you very much, Nick. I sure appreciate it. And then finally he sent this one, which is a pretty nice one too. They're all real nice ones. Every one of those is going to be excellent for making a deer antler saddle. And as a matter of fact, we can get at least two out of each antler and perhaps uh, maybe four even um, out of each antler. So again, Nick, thank you very much. He said that uh, he wanted to thank me for helping him get through a dark time in his life. Well, I, I, I actually hear that quite often on my videos that uh, it's helped someone get through some troubled times or things like that. And all I can say is God bless you. I hope uh, you keep watching. Thank you so kindly for all your uh, viewing and thank you so kindly for this wonderful gift, Nick. I sure do appreciate it. Well, the experiment worked really well. That that just about as good as it gets when it comes to gluing that on the a fretboard like that. The uh, it did stick. Uh, the glue did stick it down to the plastic pretty.
tightly. I just cleaned up this thin blade knife and just slid it underneath the wood and just worked my way through and it popped it right out, no problem. Well, I decided that I'm just gonna go ahead and use the old tried and true parchment paper. I have just a little bit of the parchment paper on here and I have it folded in a, you know, at a 90 and, and I got this piece of binding laid on top of that 90 right now. And then I'll just put the glue on here and I'm gonna, right on the very end of the plastic where the two pieces of plastic are gonna more or less 45 together, I always like to use this other kind of glue because it melts the two plastics together. Other than at that spot, the rest of it will be glued with my canopy glue. Stand the blues anymore, darling. It's just not right to treat my mind this way. I can't stand the blues anymore, darling. I've got to. So that looks really good to me. You just, I really like this for, for the jig for clamping this up. That's the best thing I've come up with so far. I've been doing this a lot of years. I've changed things dozens of times. And so far, this is what I like the best. Just so if anybody out there decides they want to make one of these kind of deals, it's just two, you know, pieces of plastic glued on a thicker piece of plastic or screwed on rather. And they're at an angle of the fretboard for a guitar is what they are. And then I just cut this wedge to match the opposite angle here. And it fits really snug and tight all the way through. And if it didn't, you could always wedge it a little bit with another tiny wedge or something. But it, it does fit really good. We can let that set now, I think, a couple of three hours and see how that turned out. Well, you can see I've made some progress. I've got the uh, fretboard extension glued onto the top. I've got the binding completely finished on the Florida mandolin here. The, uh, yeah, all the binding is finished on it, include you know the body and the peg head, of course. The UK mandolin is almost in the same shape. The fret, I also, by the way, have the fretboard completely bound for the Florida mandolin. The fretboard is being bound in a clamp uh, right now for the uh, UK mandolin. I've got most of the binding done on the UK mandolin, so basically I just felt like I had to turn the camera off and get some work done because my deadline's coming up close. Anyway, it turned out it's turning out really good. I'm really pleased with everything so far, so we'll just move on and uh, get some work done on these things. This is the Florida mandolin and we've, you can see you've got the peg head binding on there and it's still rough looking, uh, you know, all the glues there and everything. So now it's just a clean up process. One of the ways I do it is to take my little finger plane and knock off the high part here, bring it down to roughly the level and then I would scrape it the rest of the way. You got to be careful with the finger plate. It can slip and gouge something, but uh, I'm fairly comfortable doing it. Not that I can't make a mistake. Into yesterday. I can't be your fool anymore, darling. Just not right to treat my heart this way. I can't be well, I won't kid you. After I got it knocked down pretty level with this, um, then I took it into the belt sander and laid it on there lightly. And uh, you got to be careful with that because this plastic will grab on that belt and suck it out of your hand. But I did that and I got it pretty good. A little bit right in here yet that's not good. So I'm just going to get that by hand. I don't really like using the belt sander, but I have to save some time. And that, that definitely did a nice job. Um, just didn't get it as clean right in here as I want. So we're just going to take some regular sandpaper and fix that up, I think. Fool anymore, darling. Fool 
The only negative of sanding it is that it makes the binding kind of dark because this, this dust gets into the binding. And of course, you can just scrape it like that and clean it right up. But, but I'm not worried about that right now. We got a lot of processes to go before we're that picky yet. Um, but I am trying to get rid of the, the glue and just make it good and level because I have to get my router on here to route out the cavities for the inlays and things. So this has to be good and flat. Feels pretty nice now. And I, while I'm at it, I may go ahead and clean off the glue and the junk around the edges too. Might go ahead and get the holes drilled in the peg head, I don't know. Those holes don't really hurt anything when you're doing the inlay. Anyway, just a lot of little cleanup like that, which I'm not going to waste uh, footage on. Um, it's just cleanup is all it really amounts to. We're over at the drill press, and we're getting ready to drill the holes in the for the side dots in the fretboard. This one is the Florida fretboard. I've got everything. This is level, and this board here is square to the table and everything's clamped up good and tight so I'm just gonna eyeball where they go because that's about the best you can do on something like this what I'll be if I stay. all we gotta do is do it again and there's your close-up so you can see what the holes look like There are uh, about 10 million little things that you have to do to, before you're ready to put the, you know, the fretboard on here. You know, I've, I've, obviously I've got to make the truss rod and cut out the hole here. We have to do all this peg head in, inlay. We, I'm putting in these little tiny pieces here. These are just little filler pieces, and I'm rough. Sh I've got them in there and rough shaped at the moment. But it just takes a lot of hand finishing to get everything, you know, smoothed out. And, you know, like right in here, I have got to get all that smoothed out in there. So it just takes a lot of work. <laughs> uh, you know, that's why I say it's the most work is after you get the thing together. That's when the work really starts. And I've been working on this for quite a while off camera. I just... You know, it's just boring, tedious, little tiny work, so I'm not showing that much of it, but but I just thought I'd show you some of the highlights that you just have to go around this and clean this up. You have to make one that fits down in here and yet still have enough room to get a little strap through here or something. And sometimes I get that a little tight, I'll be honest, but uh, I'm going to be able to get this one loosened up, I'm pretty sure. I just have to work at it here and, and open it up a little bit. I'm putting these little dots in here. I'm using my 527 uh, glue, Beacon 527 that I get from Walmart. This is a an acetate based glue. It's got that acetone or whatever in it built into it and it melts the plastic. Um, it's for it's basically the same stuff as model airplane glue. Anyway, I just Put a little on there, get a little bit on the plastic itself here to melt them together, kind of, and then just take a nippers and nip them off just as close as I can. Leave them that way. I'll leave them that way overnight, let everything get hard, and then I'll come back and smooth it off tomorrow. I like to wipe off the little excess glue that's on there only because it just kind of melts the plastic. It'll be fine even if you don't most likely after you smooth it off but it just keeps it from eating into the plastic and messing up the plastic much so those they look pretty rough right now but uh, tomorrow then when we smooth them out they'll be fine trying to finish up the construction of the mandolins before I do this final inlay in in the peg heads here the last thing I believe I have to do in terms of construction is the two truss rods and the holes here for the truss rods. So I've got the uh, caliper set at 625 thousandths, which is 5 eighths of an inch, going across there. And, and I put a little mark there, and that would be the upper end of the hole. In other words, that way. Um, that will be, and then we'll come out this way with the rest of the hole. 
Um, I just felt like that was a good number. Uh, you know, nothing on the instruments is quote unquote standard, if you will. So you just kind of do what you think's right most of the time. There's very little, believe it or not, that is really standard on all these different instruments. So um, I just measured, uh, you know, a Gibson guitar, and that's how much room they left there was a five eighths of an inch. And to me, that looks about right on this. So that's where we're going to leave it. We're going to leave it at five eighths of an inch. Uh, for my millimeter friends, that's 15.88 millimeters. Got my Harbor Freight special drill here, and we'll just kind of look and see just to get below that mark a little bit there and and we'll be down in this cut so we're just going through into that cut and just go nice and easy we're just going through the veneer there so it's not much of a drill at all that gives me room to get my dremel in there now and start dishing this out like like so you know, I wanted to kind of mark out which how long the hole's going to be. So I set the calipers at 1.325 inches, and I'm just going to put a little mark there. That's a little smaller than the Gibson guitar hole is, and I feel like that'll probably be fine. Just for millimeter reference, that's 33.66 millimeters. I have all the square line across there. This see-through thing I can line it up with the end of the peg head there and kind of get it square it looks like so I'll just kind of just draw it in and down to about here and just kind of kind of eyeball it I think something like that that's it gives me a pretty good idea where I want to be This is, by the way, the UK mandolin. I'm going to start with it. I'm going to make sure my bit's really tight. I've got a lot sticking out here because I have to get into such an angle. Um, that reminds me, I've got the tape here. Uh, I'm going to put some tape across here below. And the reason for that is because as you go into this low angle, this likes to hit. And, you know, I know I do... I get a lot of comments about why don't I use the flexible shaft router, The uh, it's got the skinnier barrel. Well that's true, and in this particular case that might be the better choice. I've got two of those actually. I just prefer the flexibility with the Dremel and I'm good with the Dremel. And I've got real big hands so holding the Dremel is not a problem for me. I just, what I don't like about the shaft is that the shaft is not that flexible. I mean, I just don't, I just feel like the shaft creates problems for me. Everybody feels different about their tools. I just prefer to use the Dremel tool itself rather than the flexible shaft router. I will tell you if you're ever gonna do something like this, what happens is, especially with these big bits, it wants to ride, it wants to ride the way it's rotating. So it's rotating this way. So it wants to run this way. So it can grab here and run right up on top of your thing. And you got to be careful of that. So I, I'm just telling you because I know I've done, I've done it, you know. So I know how that works. Especially with these bigger bits. The small ones will do it too, but the bigger ones really do it. I'm going to be stirring up a lot of dust here, so I'm going to put on the dust mask. One of the best things about bluegrass music is that we all get together every now and again and have a jam session. Just the other night at my house, my wife was at the front door and she was greeting him with hugs. And in the hall, I could hear a banjo. I think he was picking out some scrugs. In the corner was... Well, I think you can see what we've done there. It turned out pretty nice. You can see there that I did touch it down at least once on that tape, so it's good to, to have the tape there. Um, even so, it looks like it might have still made a mark. I may have to put a double layer of tape on the next one. It made a little tiny mark. It didn't, not enough to matter because we'll sand that out. But, but uh, you got to be careful with that. That's probably good enough. Um, might not be. I may have to come back to it later. I will clean it up with uh, chisels and files and different things to and I also need to straighten it off. It's not perfectly straight because I couldn't get the angle down enough. So I can straighten it off with the small chisel here. Also, I didn't quite get back to my line, so, so I can cut back a little bit more this way. 
the Dobro when he was polishing his bar, and through the front door window I could see a tiny car, and in that little foreign car was a big old doghouse base, which only goes to prove we only need a little space. There's tuning keys and pay- All right, I'll probably come back to that and cut more out of there later, um, and make it, probably have to make it a little bigger. I always go on the conservative side when I first do these. I'll go ahead and make the truss rod for this and, and set it in place. But of course I'll do, I'll get the other one caught up to this spot here before I do that. And just for the record, there's the Florida mandolin. You can see that it's done up pretty well, pretty much the same way. Again, it's probably, the hole's probably smaller than I need, but it's good enough for now. I have a piece of 3 16 inch cold rolled steel and I'm just using it to lay it up here just to kind of eyeball how long I want to make this. I mean I could do it with just the ruler but on the other hand it looks I got a better visual when I have the steel there. Probably could get by with just 9 inches but I think I'll just play it safe and go 9 and an eighth. I'll double check on the other one. This is the Florida mandolin. I'll double check on the other one to see if I want to make it the same length. I would imagine I would, but we'll double check it. I've cut the two rods off at nine and, I actually used nine and three sixteenths. Um, both of them are the same length. I then tapered the ends. That does two things by, I just took the grinder and just spun them on the grinder and that gets rid of the sharp burr on the edges. And it also gives you a little bit of a, uh, a bevel there so that the tap will start on much easier. I have my little miniature taps here. This is a 1032. Um, 1024 would work on this rod also, but 1032 makes a finer thread, and the finer threads, generally speaking, are a little stronger. So that's what we want to go for is the strength in this case. I have a metal lathe and everything, and I could take it into the metal lathe and do it there and get it perfectly straight, but most of you aren't going to have that, so I'll just show you how I do it when I don't use a metal lathe. And you just try to keep it, you know, first of all, you put this in the vise straight up and down perpendicular so that you've got that as a reference, a square. And then you just try to keep this thing level as you start it all the way around. And, you know, you can't, you'll never get it perfect by hand, but you can get pretty close if you just take your time. And once you get it started cutting, the best thing to do is back up and break off your chip go about a half a turn, back up, break off the chip, you know, a quarter turn, whatever you're comfortable with. And it looks like we're going now, I believe. You have to apply a little downward pressure on it when you first start. You should use a little oil on this. I did not to start with, although I should. They make a cutting oil, and I have some cutting oil in the other room. Just too lazy to go get it. Three-in-one oil is what most of you are going to probably have handy, and that'll work just fine. I've learned over the years to back up and cut your thread off, and you'll have a much tighter looking thread and much nicer looking, cleaner thread. If you just keep going, a lot of times a piece of thread will break, and then you'll have a broken thread in there. You just take your time, go like this. Now, I don't think I need to go very far on the one end because I'm just going to put a nut on there and solder it. You know, it's, it's not absolutely perfectly on center, I think you can see, but it's not too bad. On this other end, um, this is the, th end, the business end, and I think I will take it to the metal lathe and get it on there really good and straight. I think that's the way I'm going to do the, the uh, business end. Th this end doesn't matter at all. I'm just going to put a little nut on there, solder it in place, and that's going to be my anchor back in the neck. Well, I did all the different operations on this. The, um, the two little nuts on the end to anchor it, I just brazed them on there with some brazing. I said I was going to solder them, but I thought, well, I've got the brazing. It's just, you know, it's a much stronger hold. Yet if I'd have had to get out my torch and everything, I probably would have just soldered it. But I just took a propane torch, which is so much easier to use, and I just heated these up and brazed it with a propane torch. And as long as you're doing something very small, a propane torch gets hot enough to braze with. But if it's not really small like this, I mean, if you're trying to do a quarter inch rod or bigger, probably not. Um, but this 3 16 inch rod with these small nuts, that was an easy thing for the... Uh, 
for the uh, propane torch to heat up to cherry red. If you can get it cherry red, you can pretty much braise with it. You know, I've got the threaded ends down here and I found the nuts to fit them. Then I made myself some little tiny washers and these little washers are pop rivet washers that I re-drilled. I put them in my metal lathe and then re-drilled them out to just slightly bigger than 3 16 As a matter of fact, I think it was a 64th of an inch bigger. You know, that's one of the problems is getting everything down in these holes. Everything's too big for these little slots and holes. And the way I've done this here, this should work out just fine. I may have to enlarge the hole a little bit yet, but not too much. You want to keep this as small as possible if you can because uh, it adds more strength in this area. The way I've done it, there's a lot of strength here anyways. This is not going to break. It's very strong compared to that one that you may have saw the video on where I said my best neck repair ever. That one had almost nothing, no meat at all right around here the way they did it. So this one's got a lot of meat. It's going to be very strong. And now to install these or get ready to install them, believe it or not, I'm going to bend this rod. It's perfectly straight right now and I'm going to put a bend in it. And you think, why would you do that? Well, it's you have to have a little bit of a bend in it so that when you tighten it, it straightens and pulls up. And there's a little bend in that. I don't know if you can see it yet. There's a little wobble in it now that maybe you can see the wobble. And that might be enough. It might not be enough. I'm going to put just a little bit more in it. I'm trying to get it roughly in the spot I want to. The, the more centered it is in the neck, the better it is. That's pretty centered. Maybe back this way just a little bit. Just a little bit more of a bend back here. Just, it's not much of a bend, but enough to, and you put the bend down, of course, and then when you tighten it, that bend wants to straighten out and go up, which is what straightens your neck. I just have to cut my slot and get and decide where I want this. I want to make sure there's going to be plenty of threads back into the meaty part, and there should be. There's the way I've done this. So to me, right there looks like the spot for this one. And we'll pencil it out. And then we'll just cut that out with the Dremel tool and force it down in there and then we'll probably even glue this in just so that it doesn't spin later. Big heads in every size and shape with cat gut on the fiddle and nylon on the bass. A mandolin against the wall tuning up to get it right and the guitar player strumming. I think he's set to pick all night. There's food out on the table, cold cuts, chips, and ham. Y'all pull your chairs up close because we're going to have a bluegrass jam. I think that's going to be just about perfect. Now we'll stick it through here and see how it looks. Wow, that's real good. That's real good. What we might do is, I never have any luck with epoxies, but we may just go ahead and epoxy that end. Um, I think that'll probably be fine on that end. Then on this end, now I'm just gonna check and make sure the washer and the nut are gonna fit before we put all this in permanently and I can already tell they're not they're gonna be a little too tight and you won't be able to get a wrench around it you gotta be able to get your wrench around it too so we're gonna have to work on this end some more and make it a little bigger which I pretty much knew that doing trial and error fitting here that's what we're really doing so I'll bring you back when we get her fit up what I didn't realize that these nuts that I've selected here to work uh, they would be fine they're just a lot larger on the diameter than I was expecting they are three-eighths of an inch and most of the time you don't have to go to a nut that big most of the time it's a five sixteenths which is what this is that's what this is. This is what I typically make the nuts out of. I cut them in half and then taper the end. Um, I was trying to take a little shortcut there. Unfortunately, I didn't think this through too well because these threads are 32 and these threads are 24. And so this will not thread on there. 
I like this better because of the small outer size. So I'm going to see if I can order these from McMaster Car with the 32 threads and use that instead. So that's going to put a little kink in my get along here on working on this, but we'll just have to uh, postpone it until we get the right thing. What I'm doing now is I'm making a filler strip to fit in above and below this truss rod to more or less sandwich it in there pretty tight. And I've got my curve on here and now I'll trace it. So I'm going to try cutting this out and this out and then this will go below it and this will go above it. I've got that little piece of wood that goes under here down in there already inserted. Now I'm going to slide Got to make sure I get the bow down here and turn that, put that in there, and then slide that in like so. And that's not too bad, it's just that this isn't going down all the way yet. So that's not perfect, but it's getting, it's getting better. Then this would go on here like so. And the, what I'd like to do then is cut a bevel on this to make it go under here all the way up to the end of the nut, which is what I'd like to do. Now that's going to be a little tricky, I think. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it would be nice to get it to go in underneath here. I left it a little big so I could cut more off of it if I need to, which I'm pretty sure I will. But you know, that's getting close. Just kind of trying to sneak up on it there. Not too bad, really. It went in about this deep right now, so so if we just cut a little bit more off of this, I think we've got it. Well, after a little bit more playing around off camera and everything and working on this a little bit more, I've got the screw just about in the, you know, the right height off the bottom and everything. I actually put a little tiny shim piece under the screw to lift it up a little bit at this end, just so that there would be enough room to get the nut on below it. Yet you don't want to get it so high because if you get it very high, then it won't cover here either. It's a very tight fit right there. I worked on this filler piece. I glued the bottom filler piece in already. The rod is still loose in there. I flattened off this top part of the nut so that it would lay flat here and it wouldn't be in the way. So really we're just about perfectly Everything's perfect. This goes underneath here and, and is flush with the front of this now, which is good so that the nut and the washer has a real good flat surface to uh, push against or pull against, whichever way you want to think of that. And so now I'm just going to put glue on both sides of this, not nothing on the bottom, and we're going to put it in the slot there. You heard a song about a horse or two. Well, here's one more. I swear it's true, the finest horse you've ever seen. His name was Phantom 614. And even though these clamps have leather on them, I'll put some leather up under here. I don't care about the top side so much. It's got leather too, though. A proud young stallion with head held high. His cold light satin under candlelight. It doesn't hurt anything if I leave it like it is, but I'm just going to go ahead and fill the whole thing with epoxy and see how that works. I've got this Gorilla Glue epoxy here, and we're going to see if we can squeeze it out. Figures that it's stuck on one side and it's coming out on the other. It just figures. His mane and tail, oh, how they sheen. His name was Phantom 614. I haven't had much luck with epoxies, to be perfectly honest with you. But in a space like this, this would be a good place to use it, in my opinion. This one, I didn't drill the screw hole in this one because, for whatever reason, it just seemed to clamp up real good itself. I tried putting a clamp on the other one and it kept sliding. This one didn't. So I didn't need the screw. The main reason I'm putting this epoxy in here is just a little bit more insurance that this truss rod won't try to spin. I don't think it will anyway, but 
This is just that little bit added insurance. It's supposed to be a five minute epoxy, so hopefully it won't take very long for it to do its thing. Thought I'd share with you how I drilled the holes in this. I didn't take any pictures of it, but you can see probably that the holes are already all the way through. And what I did was I made this jig a while back, a few mandolins ago, and uh, I can clamp that on and drill all the holes and know they're in the right place. So that jig is very handy. So I've already drilled them. I just take it to the drill press. I set it on a block of wood here in the middle. And then by drilling into that block, I put a sacrificial uh, piece under here that the drill bit hits and that keeps it from chipping out there on the back too. You can see the holes are nice and clean on the back. What's really nice uh, is when you put the tuning keys in that they just go in nice and easy too. Look, I think you can see they're just about to fall out on their, their own pressure. They're, they, uh, they're not in there. I mean, they're just in snug. The holes are tight holes. There's not a lot of slack in those holes. But you can see they don't go in hard or anything. They go in pretty darn easy, as you can see. Just one little finger pushes them right in and they fall right back out as you can see. So that's important because you don't want tuning keys that are binding on the wood. If they're binding on the wood, then you got problems. So, you know, they go in nice and smooth and easy. Now the holes have to be enlarged on this side for ferrules and we will do that too. The end of this bit has a follower that's the exact same size as the hole. And so it keeps it in the center. And then the outside here that the above this has a reamer that reams the hole out to the proper size for those ferrules. I believe I got this bit years ago from Stumac. So we're all set up to go. I also have my depth gauge set to stop where that blue tape is. So I can stop at the blue tape or use my depth gauge on my drill press here, either one. I knew that one day he'd be mine and I would ride there like a king up on It does a real nice job. You can see it just about makes everything perfect. Now I also used my same drilling jig as a, as a backup of those holes because that way this little follower stays in the center all the way through. Plus it gives room for that follower to exit the top. If you have a flat piece of wood here, then this thing will bottom out before it drills the hole deep enough, if that makes sense to you. So having those holes in there lets that follower go on into this piece, which works out perfectly. To get this to line up, I take two drill bits. One I put in this hole and one I put in this hole, and then that lines up the jig, and then I can clamp it in place. So that's how I do all that. We're just about to wrap up the build part of this. The last thing that I consider, I mean, this is still, I guess you call a part of the build. I mean, the inlay and all that, but to me, that's a last little decoration. But the last part of the build so much is putting the fretboard on here. Typically, I put the fretboard on after I do everything, um, just before I do the staining and everything. But in this case, because it's gonna take a while for this to dry, and I can be cutting out inlay while this is drying, I think I'll go ahead and glue both fretboards on and I'll go ahead and shape, get them glued on here and get them shaped to, to fit and everything. There's a little shelf right around there and that'll all be filed off smooth. Anyway, that's what I'm gonna do. I've, I've checked to make sure that my Dremel won't get in the way of hitting this, sliding it around up here because most of the inlay's up most of the inlay is up at this end anyway, so there's quite a bit of space there between the inlay and this, so it shouldn't be a problem. The way I glue my fretboards on is I, I put two little tiny nails in here, and they're really tiny nails, 50 thousandths in diameter, which is just a hair over a millimeter, millimeter and a quarter, I guess. And anyway, so they're little nails. Then I just take a pair of cutters and cut them off and that just leaves a tiny little nub sticking up. Yes, I know about salt, and you can put salt on there and then it will not move it, but I don't like that method. I don't like adding salt to my glue, you know. I just don't like that idea, especially on a mandolin or on an instrument. This keeps it perfectly still. I've already laid this on there and I've tapped on it with a plastic hammer to make a 
notch right where the hole needs to be drilled. It made a little mark. And then I've got a drill bit the exact same size, 50 thousandths. And I just drill it a little ways. I don't go very deep at all. The trainer said son, he can't be rolled. I think that'll probably be deep enough. And then when you put it on here, it just finds those holes and it locks itself into place. The fretboard's bowed up right here and it's not finding that hole until I push down on it. But it, once I push down on it, it locks it into place. You can't move it. So that's really perfect. And then I can double check my alignment here and make sure. The thing about that is once I glue this on here and clamp it, I know it's not gonna move. I've done it many times where I thought I had it perfectly solid and then I clamp it and sure enough, like the next day, I'll look at it and it's moved like a 32nd of an inch or a 64th of an inch and you go, ah, oh, man. And it's, it's the wrong time to find that out is after it's dry. So that's how I do it. I glued these side dots in here yesterday and I haven't smoothed them off yet so I'm going to smooth them off it wouldn't be hard to smooth them off later anyway but but I'll just go ahead and smooth them off I've got a very fine file here that'll cut them flush all right that ought to work that's good enough for now and double check my fit just one more time just to make sure that it's fitting where I think it is Perfect. I'm just looking down my line here, it looks like it's going right down the center. Everything looks real good. Got it lined up here at the 15th fret. So I'm ready to glue her on there. Stay away, boy, or you'll be thrown. He said that horse is just plain me. His name was Phantom 614. Well, there's what she looks like all clamped up. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight clamps on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a overkiller on the clamps, I'll admit. But, uh, you know, you want it flat. You want it perfectly attached. You don't want any waves in it, you know. And so the better you can get it clamped down, the better you're going to like it. The When you put the frets in a fretboard, it causes the fretboard to arch up because the frets take up more space than the slot. The slots are skinnier than the frets, in other words, so it expands the top of the fretboard. They always arch a little bit. So you want to really take your time and clamp the tar out of it to make sure it's good and flat. I ordered these from McMaster Car yesterday. These are the uh, nuts I was talking about that, uh, anyway, they have the right thread and everything, or they should have. And so I took one of them and I cut it off, cut it in two, and I made two tapered nuts out of them. I imagine you could just order the tapered nuts, but what's the fun in that, you know? So let's see if I can get it all to fit on here now, now that we've got the right size. It might still not be enough room. I may have to tweak this a little bit more yet. It's very close, but it needs a little bit of work to make it fit a little bit better. It'd be a little harder to make it fit better now, but I really thought I had it close. And I do, but it's just, I mean, it's just little micro pieces here and there that are touching. So I'm just going to have to clean it out in there just a little bit more. Well, I cleaned that out just a little bit more with a little chisel, and and uh, it didn't take much. It was just about ready to go as it was. But now I can get my chisel all the way around it, even with the nut on there, which is perfect. That gives you enough room to get your wrench on there. And I got it snugged down nice and tight, so it looks real good now. Very happy with that. Got good clearance here on the for the cover. Now we can... I'll do the same thing to the other mandolin. This is the Florida mandolin. And in case you were wondering, we did get the right fretboard on the right mandolin. This is the one with the uh, abalone shelf for the Florida mandolin. His name was 
Jesus Phantom 614. I have spent a couple more hours just detailing the two mandolins. Um, I cut the necks down to size and the necks are really getting close to the Lloyd Lore size. Now I'll be perfectly honest with you, my necks are a little bit wider on these instruments because I put on this little thicker binding. Now I did cut the binding down, it's not as thick as the body, it's the same binding that's on the body, but I cut it way down. Um, I think it was 96 thousandths to start with, and I cut it down to about uh, 70 thousandths, something like that. So I cut off about 25 thousandths per side, which, you know, kept, that knocked about 50 thousandths off, but it also added about, oh, I don't know, a total of about 60 or 70 thousandths width. So it's wider than a Lloyd Lore neck. The fretboard itself is the same size, but the actual neck right here is a little bit wider, but not that much. I mean, when you're talking that, those kinds of numbers, it's not very much. Well, an eighth of an inch is 125 thousandths, and it's about, I'd say, half of that wider than a Lloyd Lore neck. It's also about half of that thicker right now, although I'm still working on that. What I thought was amazing, I just weighed both of them. And I'm not kidding you, they both weigh exactly. 776 grams, just like this. <laughs> That's amazing to me. I mean, twin mandolins, yep, <laughs> they're twin mandolins. I, I would never have guessed they'd have been that close. I would have thought, oh, you know, maybe they'll be within 10 grams or something, and I thought I'd be happy with that. But they both weighed the, exactly the same, 776 grams. So I'm gonna keep cleaning these up. And then uh, that's all I'm going to do today is just keep cleaning them up. And then tomorrow I'm going to get started on the hard final job, this peg head inlay. Now I'll give you uh, an idea of what I have. <clears throat> because the UK mandolin, you know, they don't want to use the uh, abalone and all that on there. What I'm, I told him I would inlay his with wood, natural wood, just like I did on that guitar. And I'm... <laughs> seriously leaning toward doing that on this mandolin also. We haven't discussed it. I haven't discussed it with the customer yet, but if the UK mandolin turns out as cool as I think it's going to turn out by doing that, and I, in the idea of keeping these twin mandolins, I think I might do it on this one too, because I have a feeling it's going to be really cool. I'm going to use all natural colored woods. I'm not going to dye it at all, and we'll see how it turns out. <laughs>